We can start. Oh my God. Where's my little mouse cursor thing? Oh, um, anyway, I don't know how to, yeah. There we go, okay. All right, I'll, I'll get started because um, originally this was supposed to be like, a, I think a three hour thing and all that, but I'm not expecting anyone to wanna, you know, I go to bed at like, 10 10 30 properly <laughs> Don't, you know so so i'm gonna try to um give as much information but also recognize the like two hour maximum time limit also recognize that we all have not two hours of attention spans myself included um so welcome everyone i'm jamie the weird thing is is that at least half of you know all this stuff so i'm gonna like really quickly go through it um, I, uh, I live in Toronto, but I'm from here and I come here regularly, uh, start off, uh, my education in psychology, but eventually, uh, realized very late in the game that I'm actually a designer and, uh, and did that. And so I studied at York university, y York university about 10 years ago. And since then too, I've also done cer some certificates in typeface design and for some reason, perfumery as well. Why not, right? <laughs> Who cares? Whatever. Um, so I work at Sheridan College in Oakville. And yes, it is a long commute from Toronto, but uh, you know, it's, it's worth it sometimes. <laughs> um, remote teaching a couple of days a week is pretty good. Um, I also am still uh, like a practicing designer as well. So I, um, I, I do while I work in in film. Um, I do all like the boring work at the beginning, so I don't meet any cool people. I get to like Photoshop pictures of like Jessica Chastain in a scenario she might be in, but like I never get to meet them and stuff. So I work with all like the writers and producers um, before uh, a show gets made. So like um, piece of work is like uh, Lee Eisenberg, the guy who made The Office, and. Um, uh, we crashed, which was this mini series just came out. I also work regularly with Stephen Don, who um, made the new Queerest Folk, and uh, all this other stuff. I work uh, with a lot of uh, Disney and Netflix productions and stuff too, and I also do some wildlife photography. So that's kind of all the spectrums of what I do. The main thing I've been doing over the past decade. Um, almost on the on the hush hush until it finally got launched last year was uh, working on an honors bachelor of experiential design. It's kind of like the first experiential design um, degree in North America. Um, so it's kind of a weird program that um, it's like, imagine taking graphic design and like demoting it as just being a part of something bigger and considering space and all the senses. So we have courses on just the, um, the sense of smell. We have courses on Foley artistry and sound design uh, and more. And uh, anyway, if you wanna come to Oakville sometime and spend a, I'm, what I'm sure is an ungodly fortune, uh, there's that. So I, I teach these classes in, in that, all of which are, uh, I don't even know what these words mean half the time, but anyway, there's all these uh, things that you have to do when you're, you're, um, you're mounting courses uh, and the naming schemes are, are very interesting. My, uh, my associate Dean really liked the word narratives, so we had to stick that in somewhere. Mm -hmm. And also spaces, which is in, as I'm realizing now, four out of six of these courses. So um, anyway, that's kind of just a little bit of a background. Um, so take that as you will. Uh, I'm going to go through several things here tonight. Um, mainly, as you can see, we're going to break down the three main things on augmented reality, virtual reality, and modeling. Um, what I also have prepared as well is sort of a leave behind that you can scan, and there's like a whole bunch of links, including um, some of these slides so you can refer back 
Um, cause basically what I sort of realized is like, in order to like give you the, the pathways to learn this, it's, uh, unfortunately it's not going to be like just tonight, you're going to be like expert, you know, VR strategists and all that. Um, but I have, um, as you can see, there are examples of different types of workflows you can go through from like the easiest to, you know, if you want to really commit and, you know, learn how to make like fully immersive games and all that stuff, where to start and where to go. And of course, throughout any of this, uh, you can ask me questions. It doesn't have to be weird where it's just me talking for uh, whatever it is for two hours. So feel free, interrupt. Raise hand, don't raise hand, whatever. You know, the first thing about all this is when you're building virtual reality or augmented reality experiences, you're mainly thinking of like location-based and site-specific kinds of storytelling, right? So with augmented reality um, and most people who have experienced that, you're thinking of how to augment what you're seeing. And in virtual reality, you're kind of creating your own situation. So when you think about it too, there exists already to some degree, like storytelling within um, social structures already. So there's what I, you know, for lack of a better way of calling it, state supported public inscriptions, like, you know, whether it's monuments, whether it's things like cemeteries that have very localized meaning and, and uh, specific meanings to people, and even like public, you know, institutional places, not unlike subway systems and the like. There's also the other opportunity of, you know, um, you know, uh, public markups happening, right? So different kind of languages being superimposed on it. The main one I'm sure you all connect with is like graffiti, right? And there's, there's like communication going on there, whether it's from the public or whether it's among, you know, that group um, happening around us. And where I am in Toronto, it's, it's kind of all over the place. It's it's really kind of robust. Um, there's also this as well. Um, and this is kind of a thing that um, just to keep in the back of your mind as well, but historical on-site storytelling. So like haunted hikes and all that. And that's um, obviously a thing that happens here uh, a lot. There's lots of um, spooky places um, that I, I know of here. If anyone wants me to share a spooky story. <laughs> um, and another thing to think about uh, in the back of your minds as we go through these technologies is things like creative misuse. So what do you mean by that? Well, it's kind of like using technology in the way that it's not intended. So here's like an example, and you might have seen this before, um, but uh, there's this guy named Stephen Lund who draws, uh, basically he makes roots. He like follows these routes, in this case to the left in Victoria, well, both actually in Victoria, BC, where he draws basically like a super illustration from a route that he did on his bike. So like, it's kind of like, you know, really with when you're biking, you're meant to go from point A to point B. Well, this guy is, you know, kind of drawing a super graphic doing that. Another thing, and, and this was something the, uh, you know, the kids keep me young, the students keep me young, um, taught me about, because I didn't know, but if any of you have iPhones and you've randomly, um, what what's called got airdropped, meaning randomly someone tries to send you something on airdrop, um, sometimes that's like a deliberate, um, it's like a deliberate activity to like share something. So it's like, a, you know how sometimes you get um, someone standing outside of a mall or something giving out flyers. Apparently this is like the digital way of doing it now. You airdrop people flyers, hopefully like okay information. But yeah, yeah, students were like, have you ever got airdrop before? I'm like, what are you talking about? And then anyway, they showed me this. They keep me young. They taught me about Discord and Twitch. And apparently... You watch people play games now. You don't play games. You just watch people play. So it's a new thing. Mm -hmm. Still young. And of course, just to mention as well as another part is like, you can really, I mean, as you all know, um, build these entire worlds uh, from the ground up. Um, just kind of 
not even something that exists, right? And it's pretty incredible, but um, it takes a long time. And the important thing as well, and this is like obviously the Marshall McLuhan thing, but how you communicate changes what you communicate, right? So when thinking about, you know, what kind of experience you want to design in whatever location, that affects like the outcome that affects the perception. So like an augmented reality project means something different than a tweet does. And it means something different than, you know, something that's in, in etched into stone there. So just to be mindful of, of that. It's always interesting now when you hear like these big uh, events happening, like the queen, the queen uh, passing away. Right. And you just see it in like a Twitter feed rather than, you know, a big uh, newspaper headline or something the next morning. And uh, it's important to remember of the, you know, I guess the profundity of that. So that brings us to our two big tent poles being augmented reality and virtual reality. But in all, uh, it, there's sort of a, a higher scale of that too, where, you know, kind of extended reality kind of refers to um, all of these technologies that enable any kind of forms of immersive experiences. So there's augmented reality, there's virtual reality, and it's kind of a mix of both where you kind of make a little bit of a world, but you can also kind of see the world in front of you too. And, you know, it's just like everything, it's, it's not a black or white thing. There's lots of gray areas in between. And uh, the jury is still out on which one is kind of, you know, um, most interested in what fields. And you're seeing a rise in their usage in gaming and medicine and different kinds of forms of vocational training. You know, if you have to learn how to assemble something, for example, uh, that's being uh, a big thing and also in architecture. So with augmented and virtual reality, uh, just to give you a sense of like where they land in the, in the landscape of tech right now, um, you know, we have smartphones and there are just an astronomical amount of smartphones. I mean, it's probably higher than that now. This is like 2020 data, but, you know, smartphones are about, you know, 65 to 79-ish percent of the world has smartphones now. You can see the tablets are a bit less, wearables even less. Smart home devices, so that's any of those speakers and stuff like that that you play music on or ask Alexa to cook you dinner or whatever it is. And, uh, and VRs and AR devices and the like are right down at the bottom there. So if you really think about it, um, this whole thing of VR and AR taking over the world, I'm not sure, you know, if it's going to rise to the prominence of a smartphone, but it certainly is already in line with things like wearables, like Apple watches and smart homes. And, you know, how many of you have like a smart watch? That's right. So you got a couple, right? So there's like you know, half, and how many of you have like a speaker or something like that in your house that you can say Siri, Alexa, or Google to, right? So there's, you know, it looks like to me, and this is like a very imperfect uh, um, sampling or whatever, but on average, you know, for every phone, there's like a third or a fourth the amount of people that are having these types of extra or ancillary technologies. And um, it seems like every week, you know, there's something different happening in this space. Um, uh, I mean, re realistically, Apple is going to announce a headset this year, and it's probably going to make everything that I say today is completely obsolete. Um, so sorry about that, but I'm not, I don't work at Apple, so I don't know what they're doing. Um, but what they're doing is really interesting. But at the same time, apparently they also just uh, postponed uh, they, they're going to announce the headset project, but their glasses project is postponed indefinitely, meaning um, they couldn't get it to work in the way that they wanted. Um, in all likelihood, uh, it's, the tech is probably not um, sophisticated enough or, or things like battery life and that suffered so much that it's not worth putting out at this point. 
And, um, you know, so then you also see other options happening. And then you also see tech reviews like this where, um, you know, you see, you know, heavy criticism towards some of these uh, devices as well. So how I approach this is I'm like, I approach these technologies like cautiously in a sense to knowing that like, I don't, I'm not just like believing the hype. It's more like, what can this do for the goals that I want to set out? And I'm prefacing this, you know, I'm, this is an art gallery. I'm assuming you're all sort of creative types that might consider integrating this into your practice to some degree, whether you're an artist or a designer or somewhere in between. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of really interesting moments here, but I, I, I think there's some things maybe to work out still as well. It's unfortunately still in its early days, you know, um, it just is. And you'll kind of see. With that said as well, um, I mean, from PwC in 2019, um, they're really projecting huge growth in this area over the coming years. So by like 2030. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the everyday person using these devices is maybe a bit overblown, but like in terms of certain use cases, um, things like training, things like different types of physical and mental therapies and all that, uh, there's lots of opportunity there. And of course, it's already a big thing in gaming. And I think once the headsets get lighter and all that too, things like fitness and that will become massive. Also anecdotally too, um, watching movies on this is awesome. It's like you're in an IMAX theater, but like you don't have to like pay for an IMAX theater if you already have this, right? So it's, and it can be pretty cool. So uh, like, and wearing it for maybe two or two hours, around the two hour mark, you're kind of like, okay. But things like lightness and comfortability can change pretty dramatically over year over year. So like, I think it's um, getting ripe for that kind of experience already. Well, let's get into augmented reality. So how are we feeling? We all good? Oh yeah, you, yeah, Rachel has like double duties tonight. So the most important thing tonight is, <laughs> um, so we're gonna go through augmented reality first. And uh, again, stop me if you if you're confused, if you have questions uh, or whatever. Okay. So the first thing is what is is just just so we have a uh, a playing field on on what it is. So augmented reality really is that enhanced version of the physical world. So instead of replacing the entire world that you're in, it's enhancing it in certain ways. I have some examples to show, but basically it's it's kind of like now that you have a thing like a digital camera or some kind of interface that's see-through, what are some things you can overlay onto the real world um, in, a, in a meaningful way to either give like context or, you know, really add some kind of artful innovation to it? Um, it's also can be used as a, as a tool. I was showing Judd like a couple of, like an hour ago about um, how he can measure the sign he's building outside. It's something that's like built into an iPhone and like blew his mind. Mm -hmm. So um, stuff like that is very helpful. And that's that, that's a, a thing, by the way, too. You all have anyone who has an iPhone and an Android 13 and above, there's a built-in like measuring app that you can use to just measure simple things. And like even that alone is like a, a very simple form of AR that's really useful. Um, I finally know that I'm five foot, six and seven eighths of an inch, exactly. And I never knew, I was like, I think I'm like five, seven, but then some people would say like, well, I'm five, eight, you're taller than me. So I was kind of confused for many years, but then AR saved my life. <laughs> and by saved my life, I mean, it just gave me accurate information about how tall I am. Uh, um, so it usually incorporates three features, physical and digital worlds. Uh, sometimes there's interaction opportunities, right? You can 
move those digital things. You can manipulate them in certain ways. And um, accurate 3D identification of virtual and real objects. So I would say like pretty easily the most well-known augmented reality experience is Pokemon Go. Has anyone played that before? Almost over people playing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember when there was some like <laughs> there was some really um popular Pokemon or something that um showed up next to where I live. And there's all these kids hanging out in a grocery store parking lot. And it was like amazing. It was super weird just seeing like them with their phones going like tapping and I guess trying to catch this rare Pokemon or something. And anyway, so that's that's what I remember. So this was really big. Um, this is actually a while ago now. Um, I'm gonna say 2015 or even earlier. And this was huge and people still play it. Um, but yeah, you go around and there's sort of Pokemon in the physical world. Uh, you have to go to certain locations to get certain Pokemon and apparently what you do with that is you catch them and you get points I don't really know much other than that I had I played Pokemon when literally Game Boy had Pokemon so yeah god I'm getting old anyway so anyway that's that's what most people know about augmented reality um, my favorite thing that I do to make students laugh too is I, I find stock images of um like different technologies because it's just funny like look at this like it's it's just I mean it is kind of representative of what's going on but these are just some other screens of you know what augmented reality could look like this is sort of the blue sky I would say of having this these magical glasses that have all these pieces of information superimposed on top and uh otherwise you know you kind of live your life the way you want and all this and um you know performing brain surgery with AR for sure um more commonly though too there's museum types of experiences as well but so there's certain types right of of AR there's like a what's called a marker based one so markers uh the most common marker I'm sure you know about is uh, the QR code so if you've ever used a QR code to launch a menu Congratulations, you've used augmented reality, the very basic version of it, but still the most popular. And it, it uses like a, a marker of sorts to like sort of tell where to put things or, you know, where to activate a link or or whatever in this case. Um, you know, the uh, the middle section there, when you overlay your camera onto it, it, you know, has this like Batman going on. The other one is a markerless one. And if you've ever tried to see what a couch from Ikea or something looks like, you can sort of do that without, you know, needing a, a marker of sorts. You just use it within the space itself. It detects the space around you and tries to, um, I guess, guess like the size of the space so it can give you an accurate scale of, you know, in this case, if it's a couch or a chair or something so that, you know, you can see that in in the space itself. Some other cool versions that are, I guess, less used is this superimposition based one. So this would be if you want something to connect to a physical like part. So if it's like you want something to connect to the side of a house or to someone's arm, um, you can do that as well. And that can be, you know, um, obviously that's uh, helpful if you want to relate to a physical um, a very specific physical part. So like, for example, if it's, um, uh, if it, in this case, it's like the arm, it can give some anatomical um, uh, information. If it's, you know, some kind of monument, it can give further context on the monument itself. Yeah, yeah. And if you need filters for Instagram and Facebook. Exactly. So you can like position it according, like if you want something to cheat or Maybe yeah. a forehead or something. <clears throat> so I think like that would be part of this. Absolutely. Yeah. Those yeah. constellation maps are like similar to yeah. what do they tell you about the constellation. Is it like maps it to like the stars or whatever? Don't bring up the whole thing. Not sure yeah. maybe so so cool. Oh, they're very cool. Yeah. Um and we'll we'll get into that because there's there's lots of uh lots of fun stuff you can do with um 
with that. We were playing with it earlier where I turned my hair pink. And uh, anyway, it was, it was pretty funny. But yeah, so super imposition based. Sounds cool, but it's it's really simple when you think about it. Then there's the, the obvious one is the, lo the location base. So it it sort of smartly, um, you know, you can you can have things very specifically located in a GPS latitude and longitude and al altitude. Ha I learned that the hard way where I live in a condo and I was like, why is this working? And like it was set for like zero altitude where I'm like 11 floors up. And then I finally fix my altitude like oh there it is and uh anyways ripping my hair out trying to figure it out but uh yeah so location based is another thing and I would say the most popular location based um version of this very early on was uh Yelp released this uh uh feature called monocle where it, it, not unlike what you're seeing in this example here you could kind of look around you could search for coffee and it would actually sort of show where like the most recent coffee was and show you the ratings in um you know kind of in front of you like this so you know uh through your camera instead of just a list on your phone and then finally uh projection based uh examples and this is used mainly for like dioramas 3d models and such um oh and the um Kind of the the most efficient one uh, or effective one for uh, helping you um, kind of move through space and, and give you directions is this kind of outlining version. I mean, as you can see, there's a lot of like overlap and and all that. I mean, you can kind of put some of these together, but uh, those are the ones that I kind of indicated as different. Um, this is a just a little video of um, what was once called view view range. It's now called outdoor active. And um, I, used, I, I basically helped build the, the sort of um, main interface for this one uh, back in the day. This is like 2015, 2016. So this is like my first foray in the AR, I guess. And it wasn't me like building the whole system, but it was me kind of helping um, on, the, on the front end to get, get all this worked out. But what, what this is, and maybe some of you have used this before even, um, but it's a it's a it's an app that helps you go through long form hiking trails, and most hiking trails, you know, you can kind of get around without any of this support because, like, it's clearly marked. But um, not all paths are clearly marked. Like, if if you've ever been, for example, to um, Gross Morn and you do uh, the long range traverse like that's a very unmarked trail like you basically are just walking in bushes and hoping that you end up where you're supposed to end up in 10 hours um so this is like helpful to not only give you just compass directions but also kind of where to veer um you know relative to the height so that was uh pretty cool does it like exist everywhere or does someone have to actually like there's a whole team that maps out the trails yeah so it, it doesn't take much it's like a person goes out and maps it and has um kind of like the the sort of development stop software built into their phones and they might have to do some correcting afterwards or whatever but then it's basically a database built into their database so uh anyway now now this has been sort of rebranded i'm i haven't been involved in like few years now but it's now called outdoor active uh but it's the same thing they charge now for everything back in the day they didn't and it was sweet but now it's like an arm and a leg to like 10 bucks a month or something and they want you to sign up for like a year but like do you really hike that much anyway probably would be better if you could buy one per hike or something right anyway or per region maybe or something um, I also noticed some of this uh, popping up in Toronto, um, just like everything capitalism rooms at all, right? Uh, so you uh, imagine an AR, you, you, uh, you get coupons by finding AR stuff uh, in, in the middle of Queen Street West. So you go around and you, uh, you find like a burger or something and you tap on it, you get a coupon and 
found this like lipstick and I get 15% off I Love Beauty Bar, which I, you know, I, I actually, um, I used the uh, the last one to get a, uh, like a, a cocktail thing for a, for a friend. So it kind of did work, unfortunately. I hate when things work like that, right? Yeah. So anyway, it's it's now becoming a thing that is used in commerce. Like coupons can be in AR. Like you can't get this discount except in an AR experience. Like you have to find the coupon, so to speak, in this whatever verse, alternate augmented reality. So what are some purposes of augmented reality? Like what, what's, what are some things you can do with it? Um, well, the main thing that, you know, I've discovered what most folks use it for is to provide more information to what you're experiencing. So if you're, if you're at like a historical location or you want to add like a, another kind of experience, maybe someone performed there one time as a musician or something, you can, you can literally like put the audio file there somehow. Um, you can create a game-like component to the physical world. Uh, obviously, I just showed like some commercial purposes. You can also put in some some art, add some creative endeavors there. It can also be a navigational aid, and the the you know it's to be determined if this will become more of an everyday tool. If this is something that you know people start, everyone starts wearing glasses, and these glasses are augmented, and they. You know, when I'm looking at you now, like I get all this information about what I'm seeing. Do we even want that? I think the I think the jury's still out. And the it looks to me like the uh, technology isn't really there. Um, if Apple cancels their project and the couple of other projects that have existed in that space kind of got canceled or reduced, we're probably just not there. My, you know, what I suspect is the battery life is probably horrible because unless you want like super thick buddy holly like double thick buddy holly glasses um uh you're you're not going to get a full day of battery life and does everyone really i mean we already have to charge our phones sometimes our watches sometimes our computers and our ipads and you know do we really want to be charging our glasses too and all this so i i, I guess that's uh Again, to be determined, maybe in 10 years, we'll see what um, battery technology. Maybe it's a bit of so. but would you consider like uh, heads up display on a car? Augmented reality? Like that would be from the mid 2000s or? Sorry, a heads up display? Yeah, like you would have a little projector above your dashboard and it would blast like your speedometer onto your windshield. Definitely. Yeah, because I mean, it's it's kind of like a, it's kind of like the example of like a transparent like dashboard yes. of sorts, right? Yeah. And and we were talking about this yesterday, Michael, um, that one of the, the the movie versions of augmented reality that most of us know, and these are awesome movies. So if you haven't seen them, highly recommend. But Terminator and Terminator 2, right? Because it shows, whenever it shows the Terminator's field of vision, the Terminator is sort of like interpreting everything around, around them in real time so like uh, the height and size of the person or whatever <laughs> sorry <laughs> threat meter threat pretty much and stuff like that right so you know the question lies like one do we have the technology in order to keep that going for longer and let's say a couple of hours on our faces and two do we even want to you know years ago i think more people would have um latched onto it, but because of all the sort of discussions on how our data is used and often misused or misinterpreted in our agreements with um, these big companies, our trust has eroded. And so do we really want this thing on our faces? Like literally right now, if you know um, some company was seeing um, everything that I'm seeing now, I mean, and you would all be um, dealing. We would all be dealing with privacy issues, right? And uh, so it's it's also a social thing as well. Um, Google Glasses was something that came out years ago, 
And uh, I mean, they even got banned in so many different places and places of work. Even Google itself didn't allow it in most of their offices. And they made the darn things um, because of privacy issues, right? So it's, it's interesting. But how do you build an augmented reality experience? Because you're kind of like, this is why I'm here, Jamie. I want to know what's the deal. Um, so I, I kind of have like a very loose step guide. And then I'm going to go through a couple of example kind of workflows that you can go with. And then I have some sample projects to discuss. And uh, heck, we can even probably launch one or two as well to do a demo. Um, the step one is to really articulate your problem set. Like, what do you want to do with this augmented reality piece? And determine how this technology can support it, right? So if, for example, you have your task as a um, tourism development officer to like add a digital component to, you know, this uh, classic uh, historical house or something. Well, what is it you want people to know about this house as they walk by? Like what, what are, what can you add to it? Like, do you, do you want to have like, kind of like, um, like a, a spoken word storytelling thing added on? Do you, you want it to kind of have a visual superimposed on it to make it look like the old version of this structure. Um, you know, what, what are some of the ways that you want to re-envision or enhance this space? Um, so examples, so I wanna provide more context for an outdoor landmark. I wanna create like a fun scavenger hunt for kids because that could be a really fun thing to do and uh, could be educational as well. Or I want to add um, location specific media to this area. So the other things to consider, and I had to learn all these the hard way, also consider your audience, right? So um, as much as you wanna make something super unique and you, know, you, you wanna make, um, something different than like this kind of weird looking QR code maybe. The thing about um, AR too is like, you have to like inform people that it's there because otherwise, like if I were to tell you that there's an AR project out there, how would you know without some kind of way of telling whether it's a poster, whether it's um, like a little QR code or something. Um, so think about your audience and, and the barrier to entry to getting to your experience. Um, other things are like Wi-Fi connectivity and accessibility. Um, like one of the things is I, I'll show in a, in a moment here, uh, an experience I built out in Woody Point. And Woody Point is uh, awesome, but their internet isn't. Um, both their cell data, <laughs> cell signal is not great. And they have like uh, 1999 DSL internet. So all of the um, loading times for the, the AR experience there, I had to like really optimize, like it's as small as I could possibly make it so that, you know, it would, it would load fast. Um, so yeah, basically think of connectivity and technical entry barriers of, of any kind. Because at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to make this experience and then like 10% of the people you want to see it can actually see it. Um, and also think of, uh, you know, what are some unique qualities of the space itself? It's always good. And the first thing I, I do with the, uh, when I uh, started teaching this uh, last year with students is like going to the site itself and really examining it, actually having the, uh, literally built that into, um, the project itself like they had to document that they went to the place itself and look around and look for either places that where they can put their marker their qr codes um, also what makes the most sense for this location and that can be things like you know maybe it's really you know i mean have you all been to cave spear right cave spear oh you should really go it's amazing it's only a short drive, whatever, 10, 15 minutes from here, isn't it? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Take 15 minutes. Um, it's very windy there. It's very windy there. So yeah. that's the other thing. It's it's like very it's very windy, and there's certain places where you don't want to be like doing this with your phone because one, you might fall in the ocean and die. And two, it just might be a very uncomfortable experience, like being in the wind. So like, it actually makes more sense to do it like on a certain, um, like away from, uh, I think Northwesterly winds are typically there. So even thinking of like your user comfort, it's probably gonna be beneficial to you in the, in the long run. And it's only something you can do if you actually go there, which sounds like, yeah, of course. But you, you'd be surprised how many students wanted to not go all the way to, you know, their given locations and, and examine where they're going to install this experience. The other thing, step two, is determining your markers. So what are markers when I, when I say that word? Well, markers are the various ways that narrative gets attached to a specific place and environment, right? So... Again, the most common one is the illustrious QR code, right? Um, the reason we gravitate, we've gravitated towards that too, right, is because both Android and iOS operating systems have built in an automatic scanning function for those. So you can just open up your camera and within a second, you know, get that link and it brings up whether it's a website or some kind of 3D model or experience. Um, with ease and like although qr codes look like whatever they kind of just look like a barcode jumbled up if, if you ask me um like in a way that familiarity can be a good thing i always um sort of take this approach in web design where you know you, you always have uh, you always have students who want to make the most unique website and they want to have like their their menu or something in the bottom right or something like that. Um, they never want their logo in the top left and their navigation all on the top, you know, there. But convention sometimes, convention is often a good thing in design because it's like, not everyone wants to go to your website to like think about where to even go. They just want to see what you offer. Like they don't care about your website. They care about your products or your services. So if you're trying to cut, get your hair cut, you don't want to look for the navigation on how to book the hair. You just want to see, you want to see something like book. You want to see cost. You know, there's certain things you want to see. And the more easy you're able to access that, the more readily you're going to follow through on the, I guess, the payment and the booking. So, you know, markers back in the day, um, or, you know, physical markers were like stone inscriptions and, and even like graffiti and wall inscriptions. But like modern day ones as well are again, like QR codes. And there can be virtual markers. Like you can set up your devices or AR experiences to sort of um, interpret anything really. You can, you can set up an AR experience to interpret a book. Like you could have it set to, you know, that book cover there. And it sort of literally get activated only if it sees um, a certain book cover or a certain graphic. Obviously, when you're thinking of that, there's two things to consider. One is that the graphic has to be unique enough. You know, if you're trying to get um, maybe this uh, texture of the table um, working, I mean, it's probably not unique enough where it's going to be hard for it to interpret whether it, you know, it's getting the right uh, um, signal to turn on. And the other thing is, how do you tell your, your user base, I guess, where to, where to use it? The way I see it is these virtual markers, these ones that are a bit more hidden, are best used when kind of in the limited use case, if you're ever doing like a scavenger hunt and you really want, like you have a clue of like, you know, it's on top of a Ernest Hemingway book and you have to like go through this library here and there's an Ernest Hemingway book and to check it, you scan it and it works. 
that would be like the only thing for me where I would err towards the right instead of the left. When you're using it in that instance, yeah. is it like, do you need a third party like app, for example, like Arrow or like Spark, whereas like a QR code is just a link? Often what you'd have to have is you either have to have a, a built-in application that also has like the camera up at the same time. Yeah. Or, and you could build that in the web. So it could be a frame. So if you build um, it in the web, could anyone use it then? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And we, uh, again, I have a couple of examples on workflows on how that could work. But yeah, that's how it would have to go. And that's in the, in the, in terms of workflows, that's in the uh, harder echelon, but more, more about that in just a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so QR codes are industry standard and most smartphone Cameras can auto detect, like I said. Virtual markers are custom and branded, so that's cool. Like you can do whatever you want. You can make your own graphics and turn them into um, these virtual marking markings. Um, and it also allows, it can allow as well for cool interactions and animations within the marker. So in certain cases, it could have um, some benefits, but just, you know, there, there are some, um, Pros and cons to both is what I want you to see there. Like, um, you know, once you get to a point, it doesn't mean that you'll never want to use QR codes again, because sometimes depending on what you want to achieve, and if you want the lowest barrier to entry for your, your users, QR codes are dead simple to use. As you all know, I don't know if I need to get the hand raised on how many people used a menu during COVID, right? It's funny because I totally thought like QR codes were dead, like in graphic design. And then now it's just like gone the other way. Yeah. Because like, there was a time where I was putting them on like tickets and posters and then it like went away because people would just be like website Google or whatever. But now it's just like, it gets you to the direct link. Absolutely. So it's like, even on a poster, it's like direct link to tickets, direct link to the map or whatever. Yeah, they were so. not used for quite a while i would say between 2017 and 2019 they dropped i feel like COVID uh, and then and then come back and yeah, like, yeah during that yeah and it's it's so interesting how how that happened but um yeah. yeah and it's in some ways it's it's better um that you know that technology has been resurfaced because in some ways it's a it's an easy way to share things like i'm going to be able to share this link with all of you super simply at the end because you're just gonna you're gonna point your phone at that screen right there or this screen and then you're gonna get all these links it's gonna be great the next step is to choose your content obviously and what content media would you add to this place um in terms of like adding um different forms of content we'll go through that um over the the next few steps and i do have that final sort of section on modeling as well um, in which I'll, I'll demonstrate how easy some forms of modeling can be. Um, so yeah, building on reality, there's these aspects, QR codes, there's marker placement and printing, there's links to information, there's audio support. Sometimes there's things like face augmentation that um, was mentioned earlier, and uh, it also has some opportunity for the 3D modeling of objects. So in terms of like workflows, like how do you build stuff? What are some apps that you use, all that stuff? Well, I, I sort of made a easiest to hardest kind of thing. So the, the easiest way you can build an AR experience really is you can just, you can make a QR code for free online. Um, just go QR code generator free and uh, make the link, you know, so like if you have a website, you just, plug in the website, it will generate a QR code. And that's that's really it. Um, if you wanna make a very, very simple uh, web AR experience, so something like like a, a little like circular object or something, um, you know, connected to a, a QR code again, there's a, a free uh, kind of web platform called My Web AR. It has limited functionality, but for, super ultra basic stuff you can get by with that is it that one's free free yeah mm -hmm. um 
glitch is another one of these. So what glitch is uh, really is it's it's kind of like um like a coding playground in a way. It's like you can um you can kind of uh, set up small little web projects or web web pages, um, and you can basically like remix other people's work because um, it's all sort of open source. So like, for example, you can go on Glitch, so it's just glitch.me um, is like the, the web domain. And uh, I have it linked in the resources so you don't need to memorize that one. And you can look up like AR experience and like the code and all that is already done. And you can just remix it. You can add like your own, you know, text or your own, you know, model or whatever to it with very little effort. And uh, they even like store the website for you on that. So you don't have to deal with like servers or, you know, setting up your own hosting or any of that stuff. It does it all for you. So that's pretty fantastic. Um, so that's definitely worth trying out, especially anyone who comes from like a web design background and has uh, limited, but maybe some basic knowledge in HTML and CSS. Uh, the other, another one that uh, is really fun and not as, not super difficult to use is Adobe Arrow. So Adobe Arrow um, uh, is free to use currently, which is great because um, it's currently in beta. So unlike um, all the other Adobe apps, which cost an arm and a leg, plus another arm, maybe in the leg too. Um, yeah, on a monthly basis. Uh, this is free and it, it comes on Android, iPhone, and there's a, a desktop app um, for Mac or PC. And basically you can build, you can build the experiences in any of those four platforms, but of course you might wanna build it on your computer and then sort of launch it on your, on your um, phones and such. And, uh, uh, you know, I really hate touting uh, Adobe's, uh, you know, Adobe as they are very much a monopoly in the creative space, but Arrow for many use cases is in all likelihood a good bet to start off with um, for your AR project. There's just, um, there's a lot of features that you can do. You can do some light animations, um, you can, you can set things up quite well and it auto generates, uh, codes for you and everything you can do, uh, horizontal markers, meaning it will, you know, your experience will show up on a horizontal surface or a vertical surface, like a wall. And, uh, it's, it's really something. I think you can import like, um, 3D models as well yeah. from like other apps. Oh yeah. Into Era where I don't, I don't know if you can do that with Spark. Can you? Yeah. Can you? Oh, I made something in Spark, but I was just like, well, like falling down a rabbit hole trying to figure it out. Oh, <laughs> well, well, se segueing to this next one, Spark. And I, I have some visual examples of what these do, by the way, momentarily. Um, but Spark AR is uh, made by Meta. So the Facebook people or whatever. And um, if you've ever used, uh, you know, an Instagram filter before and like, you know, got lip filler or <laughs> change your hair to pink or something, um, that was built using Spark AR. And it's basically a, a pretty easy and straightforward way to, um, to build AR experiences. And it's not only for the front facing camera, although they tout the front facing camera quite a bit for probably the Instagram reasons and all that. But you can also use it for other, you know, rear facing camera stuff as well. Um, uh, and it's also quite easy. I find its documentation really, really good. Um, they have examples, example projects posted um, and uh, it's free as well, which is good. So definitely worth checking out. It doesn't work on my computer right now. So it's very, uh, I don't know what's up with that, but anyway, it might work on a computer, it might not. Mine just crashes all the time now. That's a desktop one too, right? Yeah. Like you had desktop that you use. Yeah. But... Yeah. To, to build the experience, yeah. And then um, to add more 
workflows. Mm -hmm. um, there's also 3D scanning. So this is like a part of that. So like, mo you know, when you're building out your models, there's there's a way to, I don't know if all of you know this, but like, it's actually pretty easy to make 3D models um, now, at least um, at least certain ones. The hardest, absolute hardest stuff is if you want to build all of your complete AR experience in Xcode um, and creating USDZ files. But uh, yeah, I don't know if that would be useful. And the even more advanced versions um, would be using more of the sort of gaming platforms such as Unity and Unreal Engine, where you can, I mean, you can really create like any kind of immersive environment you want. You have full control over you know, um, interactions and all that, but there is many hours of work in front of you. Like it's, it's, um, it's worth getting into if it's something that you're passionate about and you know that you want to invest the time, but um, it's hundreds of hours. It's not like five or 10 hours. It's hundreds of hours of getting into stuff. It took me like two days to install Unreal Engine put it that way. <laughs> Like it's like 90 gigabytes, gigabytes to install. So um, it's a beast, but uh, but it's super fun. You'll see a couple of examples. Um, this is like my web AR, just to, like examples of what you can do. Just, you know, it's just kind of this little type of platform. If you wanna, if you wanna do anything more meaningful, like they, you know, it's that kind of thing where like, the basic version is free, but then, you know, if you want to do anything fancy, they, they gouge it or like five bucks for this and six bucks for that. So, I mean, I just want to bring your attention to it just because it's there, maybe worth checking out for a minute and it does auto generate QR codes for you. Oh, um, little thing that I started testing out as well is I actually bought this um, from some I, I bought this randomly on Kijiji, uh, but there's these little uh, 3D printers you can get now, or not 3D printers, um, uh, these little printers that are really helpful for printing off your QR codes. So I see this a lot in Toronto, like you just see stickers on the sides of um, crosswalk signs and all this. And uh, uh, anyway, they're printed on these, uh, uh, it's like the, yeah, the thermal printers. So like there's no, there's no ink. It's like a fancy um, label maker. It, it is a fancy label maker. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, you know, if you really get into this, uh, there's a lot of like opportunity there um, for uh, for making, like this is an easy way to get your, your um, QR codes printed basically on a sticker. Because of course, you always got to think about that. Like, how do I actually show this to people, you know? Um, so just wanted to draw your attention to that. Uh, glitch. So anyway, Glitch has lots of uh, cool um, examples. I'm just going to bring up one here. Uh, how did this change to being something else? Of course it did. Oh, never mind. It's just loading. So that you can do like 3D models and you can store them on, on websites. These are all 3D models of food, which is obviously the best. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so this is sort of an example of a really cool like augmented reality menu, right? Just imagine if you're doing your restaurant and you're like, this is my burger. And it's, you don't just see a picture, but you can swirl it around and be like, that piece of lettuce looks crummy on that side but it looks great on this side so again glitch is just um kind of a website that stores this stuff and you can edit and stuff within it if you log in and that's free as well it's like another this is not scanning right this is illustrated no those were just like scans yeah. so i'm going to show you in a bit like the whole scanning thing. Um, next up is Arrow, and um, Adobe Arrow is pretty darn neat. 
so this is sort of what it it looks like when you're building out your um uh you know an example uh, experience or whatever so as one example like here's like a layered psd file like a photoshop file right so all of these like four colors are basically different layers in a photoshop file for anyone familiar with that so then you can just add it in and just give it a second because probably a big file there So it loads itself in and you can do some adjustments in terms of like placement and all that stuff. You can like adjust the size, um, you know, how big it exists in the world and all that stuff. Move it around. And one of the cool features built in, and you know, it's it's a benefit to I guess Adobe being um, like having all these apps and being able to sort of interpret all of their different apps together and you know in a cohesive way. But it allows you to do this cool layer separation thing, so you can have your artwork really in no time have this really cool kind of layered effect in AR with like almost no work like you could if you have a your psd file set up right um you know there it is and you can basically just launch this as an ar experience and literally like walk through it view it side to side and see the depth going on there I'm just kind of walking through you there now so that's that's kind of one example there this is that spark ar one the the facebook one and you can see here how i, I have my emoji um freckles on i guess and it like follows my like my cheekbones yeah it's very strange bad hair day that day but and it like i don't know if you're looking at the two sidebars you're kind of like this looks a little complicated but my god it's like really not it's uh it's pretty easy easier than arrow yeah arrow. yeah it's just like emotion many yeah i i find spark too it's like it's it's a lot better at interpreting like we were talking about this earlier as well but it's good at interpreting like things like faces or hands or whatever because it's owned by meta and meta has so much user data that it's really good at those models for that reason because it has a huge data pool so it's kind of like e, i like this but hey i don't <laughs> yeah because it it really is really great at interpreting hair and all that so some sample ar projects um i did this yeah i did this um uh woody point um uh so writers at woody point kind of commissioned myself and uh my main squeeze, Judd Haynes, um, who did the, all the illustrations for this uh, to make this kind of um, like kind of like AR, I don't know, mapped project for when the folk festival isn't going on because um, Writers of Woody Point just happens for one week a year. But like if you're in Woody Point like right now or maybe in like April or May, you know, it's like, how can we kind of keep that some kind of experience there for um, for the whole year? Mm -hmm. So what this looks like is there's like a map placed along certain uh, areas of the town. Um, there's actually a map, like that map, like right where the map of the whole town is, which is pretty intense. Oh, so I was cool. like, thank you. <laughs> and then when you go to each of these um, locations, right? So in the center that you see like the heritage theater which is sort of like their main well it's like their main kind of arts and culture center basically and it's in like the heart of the town um, you can see a plaque and you can see the qr code and you can scan that code and i mean you can literally do it right now if you wanted and you can scan that code and you can hear um, alan doyle sing a song that he performed at the heritage theater a couple of years ago 
So nothing really super fancy, but of course it serves that purpose, right? Of, you know, sharing that experience, it works, um, you know, uh, not a lot of kinks to work out in the end. And, uh, and anyway, it's, it's a nice little walking tour. We've had a couple of people, um, share that it, it was really something nice to do on like a rainy day. Like if you're there in May on a rainy day, what are you going to do? This is not a big walk. This is maybe if you were to do the whole thing, it would easily take you less than an, a whole hour. It's, I mean, if, if you didn't rush through things, uh, or if you, if you just kind of did this walk and didn't stop at all, it'd only take you like 20 minutes mm -hmm. to that whole ring. But, um, yeah, it's just something to do maybe on a, whatever, like a whatever day in Woody Point. Did this other one as a demo for, um, for, I guess, student projects. Um, I don't know, Jack the Ripper. I, I was just like, wouldn't that be cool if there was like a sort of Jack the Ripper walking tour? I went on one of those years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so kind of built out a, uh, an interface um, where not unlike the first example, there's all these different sections. And uh, depending on where you end up, you get this information about like, I guess where the murders or significant happenings took place during the, um, you know, I guess the, the city of London, uh, Jack the Ripper crimes mm -hmm. back in the uh, Victorian era. So there's uh, that as well. This is some, just some student projects that, uh, you know, kind of happened in the fall. The students making these, uh, they had, they were tasked with making um, um, different forms of wearable garb um, in AR. So the student, I think this is a Sailor Moon one or something. Um, anyway, they're all so cringy and great. I love them. <laughs> um, and then we had this one, which uh, this is a student project for, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, there's a lighthouse in uh, Toronto. <laughs> And uh, anyway, the student made all these things. I had to launch it in my my room because I didn't go all the way to the the lighthouse to market. Um, but uh, you can see, according to our local legend, there's a like an audio component to it. There's like a whole kind of animation, um, kind of showing off different places, and like there's this whole thing where like someone found like a jawbone and all this stuff. And you see like the jawbone. Anyway, this was pretty good. And um, yeah, I was pretty impressed by these students because they're second year and uh, they had no idea what was going on. Uh, like they they have very little 3D modeling experience. These are like 18, 19 year olds. Um, so not bad. And uh, anyway, so this was Gibraltar Point Light Lighthouse. We found that there was uh, like a whole story going on there. And anyway, we got them to, uh, it was a group of uh, three of them and they uh, concocted this AR experience for uh, this lighthouse. So this is on Toronto Island. Um, so Toronto has like an island next to it. Um, and there's like kind of, this lighthouse hasn't been used in years, but it, it had um, kind of like a rum runner history, storing alcohol in the prohibition area era and stuff. And someone's jaw got found eventually in a casket. <laughs> yeah, I was I was impressed because yeah. Anyway, sometimes they uh, impress the heck out of me. And then uh, there's a distillery district one again because these uh, I wanted the students to go to their actual locations. Uh, these are all based within the uh, GTA, the Greater Toronto Area. Uh, so this, the distillery district's really cool. It's this area down um, in downtown, on the east end of downtown Toronto. And it used to be uh, one of the oldest distilleries in North America. Um, it was actually shut down for years and was derelict for about 30 years. And then for some reason, they shot X-Men there, the first one. And then it became kind of popular for 10 years for a few other films. I think Chicago was filmed there, something like that. And then it it's now like really built up as a um, uh, as a destination, like kind of a shopping area and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it has 
all of the buildings still intact and it's really beautiful it's such a beautiful like cobblestones and and nice beautiful brick buildings and one thing that the students identified is certain buildings um really are just there there's no context of their history mentioned at all and it's like you know you go in this was like the second oldest structure ever in Toronto but like it's now like a freshie or something mm -hmm. and there's nothing and it was like the students kind of built like what if we amended this with an AR experience that gave some context to what it used to be was sort of the the response the assignment or, or whatever and this uh this is just uh like another example of that um that whole uh, sort of layering technique that you can do and I'm just going to demonstrate that um, live here so one cool thing is even if this is a project built in arrow this device doesn't have arrow installed on it um, and I do that on purpose because what it, I want to show is that um, what it does is it automatically um, even if it doesn't have arrow installed on iOS and on Android, it has this kind of, I guess it kind of like, um, it kind of pre-installs the app so that it works. So like you can use Arrow, and this was a big thing that they built in in October where you don't have to have Arrow downloaded anymore. Cause of course that's a big barrier to entry, right? Mm -hmm. You want, if you want to build something in Arrow, you want like the first thing you'd want to ask is like, can anyone just use it or do you, do they need to have an app installed the second you have to have an app installed that reduces like people's desire to want to use it you know you want someone to be able to access your stuff just from a camera when did they add that that was october okay yeah cool. and um i also yeah and so you can see here a layered Ooh. version of uh of that right so all this is again is a photoshop file and these little sections i decide i like made into different layers so you can and you can like walk into it you can like you know just see the depth of it stuff right yeah and that's super easy it's like five minutes you know you can adjust the scale you can make it bigger smaller any which way you want you know so you can if you want it to be a nice 24 by 36 poster size in AR, it will be that big. I wonder if there'll be a day where you just like don't have to download an app and it's just like. Well, that's, I think that's going. where people want to be, right? Yeah. Because again, all this extra stuff. Otherwise, you're just like, everyone's going to build it on like the Instagram or yeah. like the Spark or whatever, because it's like just easier yeah. to use. Um, so that brings me to virtual virtual reality, the next sort of little section. Um, I guess any questions so far? Do we need a break? Do we need, is everyone feeling good? Okay. Well, of course, if you do need a break, however, you know that you can just, you can just do your thing. Um, so virtual reality, it's a, it's, it has similarities, but it's a little bit different, right? Virtual reality deals with really the computer generated simulation of of uh, a world, right? It's like you're really in a different place. You create the whole darn place. So, I mean, what's neat about that is like the world is quite literally your oyster and then some. Um, if you've ever wanted to, wanted to feel like you're in space or you're, you know, roaming the earth along with the dinosaurs or whatever, or you're down hang out with sharks, but you are not going to get eaten by a shark. All of that is possible to some degree with virtual reality. Um, and, you know, so it it's made possible by these, uh, these headsets. This one right here is probably the most um, popular today, at least in North America. It's called the MetaQuest 2. It's made by Meta, who once was known as Facebook. Um, these run, for some reason, at one point they were $400. Now they're more expensive, even though they're the same thing. Just mm -hmm. raise the price for some reason. Um, I got it when it was 400, so it was great. Um, big, 
basically, you know, kind of how it works is you stick it on, you have these like controllers. Um, if you see here and you see, you know, throughout the device, there's all these cameras and, and all this to, in order to detect like things like your movements, your position in the world, um, in hopes that you, um, you know, uh, either have like a, what's called a boundary created. So like, if you're doing something where you move around, they don't bang into things. And also this allows, this kind of weird ring thing allows it to sort of detect um, the positioning and movement of your hands. So that if, if you're, um, if you have a lightsaber because you're playing a Star Wars game, that it knows that like the lightsaber is here and you're moving it back and forth. So it does all this and gonna let you all play with it soon too, whenever you want. Um, you know, you'd think that like AR and VR aren't that different because it's like one is just, you know, a world and the other is just stuff on top of the existing world. But VR in many ways has way more complexity added on because it really removes you from like the things that we um, relate to in this world. So things like, um, like how we move is something you got to think of. So there's different interaction types with virtual reality. There's this like almost like diagram, like, you know, do you interact with things physically or artificially? Like, are you, are you walking around or are you moving the joystick, for example, and, you know, guiding yourself that way? You know, are you just sitting down and, you know, kind of moving in that way? Or are you physically standing up and kind of working out in a way? or whatever. So there's motion types as well, whether it's continuous or, or not continuous, like there's certain ones where you, um, uh, you know, you, you move as if you're walking and other ones where you move as if you're teleporting to, you know, places that you can see. Um, interaction spaces, like, are you in this world that feels never ending or are you in just a room? That's another factor. Can you move to other rooms, other levels and such? And um, yeah, like what are diff the different sort of types of what are called in this space locomotion? Um, whenever I think of the word locomotion, I think of that do the locomotion mm -hmm. song. Good. Great song, amazing song. But there's all these different types, right? It's like avatar movements, scripted movements, steering movements. What I sort of have is like, here's a, here's a couple of like little videos kind of going through things. This is the video. Oh, yes, it is. It's, it, it is that video. It's just smooth. Okay. Um, this just goes through a couple of like examples of what it looks like. Um, there's sort of a video of the person using the headset, as well as what the the sort of environment looks like when they're using um, the headset itself. So this is like what climbing looks like that you can climb, right? Right, so you can grab onto these shrubs or whatever they are, those little thingies, nub things. Yesterday, James were talking about this uh, VR conference I went to, and on one of the floors they had a demo room, and it was honestly one of the strangest experiences that I've had in a while. It was, it was four or five demo spots, and you're in this room, but no one is with each other. They're all like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like wave their phones around. It. Very strange. It's it's a very <laughs> very strange thing to be to be involved in. Um, and here's. Uh, kind of like almost like a compilation of different types of movements in different like video games as well as like just general VR experiences. So you can like swing, like it's almost like you're like a sort of monkey in this one. And then just hang on now you're, yeah. So you're like swinging into jungle gyms type of thing. <laughs> Coming up right after this is Spider-Man, like literally. Um, yeah. So you know, and in this case, you're, you're obviously not like walking, you're sitting down or whatever you're, you know, if it, this is sort of what I'd look like 
I guess, if I was if I was doing that. But I of guess course. most of them you don't, aren't using the legs because that would be super dangerous. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so here's Spider Man. That's fun. Right. So it, it definitely looks fun and all that. Um, yeah. I bet people do. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. No, there's there's lots. There's also um, you know, yeah, like really. So one one thing that's actually um, becoming a a bigger thing too. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention with VR that's an obvious thing is flight simulations have been almost like the earliest forms of VR, right? Any forms of like auto simulations, but another thing that's being worked on and, and I mentioned like mental therapies is like ways to overcome phobias. This VR thing is becoming increasingly uh, like a potential opportunity there. So anyway, you're just, you're seeing like one of the complexities here, right? Is figuring out like, how the heck do you move? If you move, like what are the mechanics of it? How does it feel to, like move and and what are like even the buttons you pressed on these remotes, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the locomotion thing to think about. There's also what's called this idea of colliders. So that's a sort of fancy word, but all, all it means is like, you know, since you're not banging into things literally, like right now there's a collider that, you know, when I hit this table, like my brain is sending that signal that there is pressure here, meaning there is a physical, thing here but in vr that doesn't really exist so there's a few things that need to be considered one is like how you when you're setting up your environment that like you know instead of uh you have a, a plant on a table and it's actually hovering over here it actually for one sits on the table itself and also too if you're doing things like opening a door or banging into a wall um like what kind of um feedback do you get so like our phones which vibrate when we get notifications or whatever these um these remote uh controllers uh serve as giving us that feedback as well you know so they vibrate all the time uh, ensuring we don't bang into things uh virtually not even physically but virtually and it's a very weird feeling because you're not actually moving right so imagine banging into a wall and you feel the sensation of banging into a wall not it doesn't like hurt but like you it, you gently bang into a wall but you're actually sitting down right so it's like i'm right here but like because of these and because my perception has changed because i have this this headset on let's say i get this like jolt because I accidentally banged into a wall. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of these things to consider with VR again, that you don't even have to think about with AR. Um, so these colliders and anyway, there's all these different examples. Like it's like, it could be walls. It could also be like when you bang into other characters, mm -hmm. it could be gentle colliders. Like if you're just, what if you wanna create the feeling of walking through um, high like grass or weed, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not like you can't walk through it, but there's a little bit of resistance, right? So there's all this. And if, if I'm to be completely honest, this is where all the stuff for VR really fails at this point. Like, I don't think we're there yet where any of this makes sense. And that's why if you saw that review at the beginning, it says, get me out of here, um, that The Verge wrote about the most recent uh, MetaQuest Pro. It's because all of these, like, if you just watch a video, which I, I hope one of you try out uh, one of the videos that I have set up uh, momentarily there. Um, if you just watch a video, it's it's really amazing. And you get to see like something in three, uh, 360 and it's it's really meaningful. But I feel like the second that you start trying to do stuff with these remotes, it's like cringeworthily bad like it's um there's there's a few where it's like you're meant to build stuff with it um like you can it's one it's called like shapes xr and like i tried to like build the drum set and it i i almost like 
wanted to just die. Like it was so. It was it was not only it was emotion sickness compared compared with the like, the weird feeling that you. You can't pick up There's stuff. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, well, it's it's almost like the interaction stuff is not like sensitive enough to know what you're trying to do. You're trying to like pick up something in front of you, mm -hmm. but you also have this weird phenomena going on where like because you're holding these things, right. you're already holding on to something, so it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Like imagine you're trying to pick up something, but you already are holding on to something. Yeah. you're kind of like you but my hands aren't free Ooh. so there's like a distance going on yeah exactly <laughs> so you know i i i obviously you know full disclosure like i haven't played every vr game that's ever existed i'm sure there's maybe a couple that have really good interaction opportunities but in my limited but maybe somewhat decent experience I haven't found one that was like really, really amazing. Cause like even the Spider-Man game, which I played to try this out, when you're when you're flying around, it's really cool. But then when you um land, like you still feel like you're um you're holding on to something, right? So then I find like I'm always spinning my webs and then I'm always like falling off buildings and then catching myself. <laughs> And it is a nightmare. And like, I'm pretty good at like, like if anyone's going to get interaction paradigms, it's probably like I would be in the camp of getting it because like I study it. And so I can't imagine how horrible of an experience it'd be. I always try to think of stuff for my parents. Like how, how would my parents feel about it? Now they loved the static videos. Like the gimmick of it, yeah. But like, you know, moving stuff around, I think needs a lot of work. And that that was like this, um, the get me out of here review from The Verge, which is very recent. It's only like a month or two ago, two months ago, maybe. Um, that uh, really depicts that, like there's a lot of cool, interesting concepts there, but because the way in which you interact is so clunky, it kind of ruins everything. It makes it all feel very ridiculous. So, so I'm not saying like that will never get fixed, but I think that that part is really not there yet. Because really what this feels like to me is a bunch of gamers came up with a way to interact with the world and it works well for a video game, sort of, but not for anything else. Like, I, I mean it when I say this, for you to type in your password now on the VR headset, you literally have a laser and you're like doing this. <laughs> And to me, I think, I mean, I just like laugh every time I do it. I don't know why they wouldn't do gloves because you could do like the hand gestures and your fingers. I guess it's, it's too heavy. It's more nice technology parts. <laughs> well, well, ideally, right? Ideally, you wouldn't need any of this. You might have a wrist bracelet or something for haptic for that, you know, motor feedback or whatever. And because of all these cameras and all that, it would be able to shine down a keyboard yeah. and all that. There's a, re there's a reason why even like 25 years, 30 years later, we're still, we still so, have so like, it was, Yeah, I, my studio is up here and like I had frightened so many times today from the ice. Like I thought somebody was like coming through the window. <laughs> like, oh, I bet that's what it is. But um, Sorry. like, no, 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 no. And and that scared me earlier at my at my parents' house. It fell and oh my god, I must have jumped about ten feet. Gigantic piece of ice. I don't know if you can show you. <laughs> we'll talk later. Because um, I mean, at the end of the day, if you want to type, I mean, there's a reason why even now. I mean, just think of how long this QWERTY keyboard has existed on computers. So like especially if you're trying to get more and more people to use something, latching on to as many conventions as possible is going to be to your benefit. So having like a, even, even if it just kind of beamed down and you could turn any surface into a horizontal keyboard, like right now, if I had this on and I could use this to type in my password, that could be a better solution than what's currently offered where, I mean, literally you're like, 
like has anyone tried to um type in their pastor on apple tv yes, right it's sure. it's literally like a new form of torture right <laughs> It's like, even if your password is like orange one, two, eight or something, like it will take you 20 minutes. Yeah. It's like, you're the like, only reason I activated like the voice thing. Yeah. I was like, I also just would make a mistake. Yes. Yeah. Like it's, it's just a horrible experience. There's also like an uh, alternative keyboard for people with um, uh, difficulties with you know, mobility and yeah, stuff. That could probably be adapted to your um, features really yeah. well. Yeah. You know, where you can you know, select a section of the keyboard with one hand yeah. and select a single letter with the other hand. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking too about, um, so this is a thing too, like Apple has four or five patents that are similar to what you were talking about. And that's the thing. I mean, all of this might be pointless in like a few months because mm -hmm. whatever they come out with, it looks like. Like I suspect because Apple has, I mean, tons of money and some really talented designers mm -hmm. and there is no real indication that they've made remote controls. There's evidence of the headset, but no one really knows about the remote controls. And to be honest, I'm the most interested in what is to come for this stuff. Um, this will get lighter. This will get more comfortable over time. You know, we all know that like our phones are actually our phones are bigger <laughs> uh but you know they're more yeah <laughs> yeah but anyway our phones have gotten more sophisticated and more and have been iterated on now um and so i you know i i could see that already but there needs to be a lot of work in that space mm -hmm. um and it sounds important i think this last one but one before amy brandon did a workshop because she was kind of trying to do uh, with the VR there. Yep. Uh, and she was using it. She was trying to basically create uh, an interactive sort of instrumentation. And so right. when you had the VR set on, there was this, well, it was basically like we were reaching out and we were touching something and the manipulation of various icons for all the right. call on icons. You know, you, you could so like pull them and move them around and, and they would all alter how these sounds behave right so it was almost like having what well, was almost like having some of the electronics you know the various downboard yeah, yeah but but it had been translated into into all these like, iconic elements in this vr space which which was intriguing it was again sort of difficult but it wasn't it was it, it didn't have any of that sort of uncanny valley stuff because its utility was completely removed from a space where you can compare it to the quote real. I see. Quote. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to revisit that project. Yeah. Take a look at it. Well, um, I don't know how much she's done with it since, but then we would spend a project she can find it for us. Okay. So there's there's another part of this as well um, with VR and and you know for any who think that like you start and you make everything from scratch here. Um, it just is not the case. Usually you, there's in, in all of the, the sort of big um, components of uh, or platforms where you build VR uh, experiences, there's assets to download. So we'll, we'll talk about that, but the, it was one thing to mention in terms of the properties of of VR at this point, uh, just for anyone who's like, wow, how do you like build everything? The short answer is you don't necessarily need to build everything from scratch, but you know, it's like, how do you make things unique? It's like about bringing things together. Um, and uh, you can do certain things as well with your, your models that will make that unique. The first thing with building uh, virtual reality in any form anyway, and I mean, this comes from both my experience, but also, my experience from taking some of these Unity classes, Unity being one of the heavyweights in um, VR development, but it's about articulating as best you can the world that you want to create. And some of it just starts off with a very simple mind map. Like I, one of the um, only kind of professional projects I got to work on so far with VR is there's this um, sort of like TV show, VR TV show, me thing um coming out in amc next year called the last 
broadcast. It's basically about a um, revisit like old places. So each uh, episode is like on, you know, going to like, you know, in 2040, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa that has now, you know, crumbled. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to be like, I don't know how they're actually going to do it, uh, but they're, it's basically going to be a TV show meets like a VR headset scenario too. Like there's sort of going to be a vignette accompanied with the t the episode where you can visit the place that it's taking place in and walk around in it. And I had to do, I was sort of involved in the development storyboarding of it. Um, it's done by uh, Russ Cochran, who is sort of well known. Him and John Fawcett founded, uh, not founded, but they created uh, Orphan Black, that show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, that was pretty fun. And that sort of taught me about, okay, that's how you like really got to think about building the world. You got to think about it like almost you're a film person. You're developing, you know, if you think about a show like Breaking Bad, it's not like a world that we are unfamiliar with, but it is a world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's obviously in it's in New Mexico. It's certain heat. It it has certain matters of emphasis within it obviously in terms of like the drug cartels and all that stuff, but it is a world. So it's about thinking about a world and creating a, um, uh, you know, a, a structure within it and a, vi a visual reference for it as well. And then step two is determining the world mechanics because that is ultimately gonna ha help you decide how, um, what, what kind of applications to use. So should the experience have the ability, should experiencers have the ability to walk around? That's the first one. Like if you just want someone to be able to walk, like look around and, you know, they're kind of just standing here. If I just wanted to make experience right now where it's just me sitting in here, that's one type of experience. But what if I wanted to walk into this room? I wanted to walk around and uh, look more closely at the books down here. That is um, a different setup. Do they need to grab or pick up things? So are there interacting objects? Is the experience guided? Meaning like, is there some sort of talking head that's telling you what you can and cannot do? Um, Sorry to yeah. So I don't know if you watch the behind the scenes, but the, the set is actually a screen. Yeah. So they created like the, the planets and the desert are like a TV screen that's giant. And, but then they had to like put all the shadows in. It's really cool. Like, yeah. I know. Getting no, it, but it, yeah, I know. That's it's like, like a situation where you could use that, but like it was, it was the background for the show and a lot of scenes. Yeah. It's like ultra CGI meets like, yeah, yeah weird, something else like virtual reality background that is actually like static but like moves slightly with like shadows it's like it's not a green screen so it's essentially like a massive television with like a, like the planets of the desert in the background mm -hmm. and then they shoot it in front of it and in post they were like adding like shadows yeah. from what was happening in like the film set yeah. so yeah, michael it's really imagine it's like an unreal <laughs> engine project and like you put it on like a like a 40 foot TV or something like that's pretty much because I, I watched the same like vignette. And I was like, this is Unreal Engine Project, which, yes. which is the name of the program. It's unreal. It's pretty hilarious what they did. Sorry. No, no, oh my God. Oh my. Um, and another thing is like how long or how expansive maybe is a word to use there. How long do you? how you know how big do you expect your experience to be because that's another thing too if i mean if you're getting into like multi rooms and all that stuff too that's to consider as well and you're you're getting more into something that looks and maybe feels like a game which is all good but it's it's just being mindful of of you know the terminology the language so that you use the right i guess program um at the get go um because the next step is about choosing the workflow that is most suitable to the questions you answered. Like, for example, if you just want a static, you don't no walking or interaction, discovery based, non locomotive experience. And in certain ways, that's your benefit. Like, if you're trying to install this in like an art gallery or something, it's kind of going to be hard for you to like walk around, have people walking around or like having lightsaber duels or whatever. 
it's not like impossible, but it's just, it's, you know, that's another thing to consider in terms of your, your installation. Um, if you do just like kind of a basic setup, you actually can do all that in Adobe After Effects. You can do that in um, like a much simpler workflow pipeline. But if your project is, you know, very much of the motion and interactive ilk, then you can consider using Unity, uh, which is a, a pretty well-known game development platform, also has many uh, mobile applications as well, or Unreal Engine, which is kind of the beast. It's like most, um, you know, a lot of video games these days are made in Unreal Engine. And uh, it's like a professional, um, yeah, 3D environment immersion generator. The final step, and I, I, I don't mince words, but work through hours and hours and hours of tutorials and begin collecting an ever expanding library of what are called prefab assets and plugins. It's really that simple. So there's no real shortcut to this. Like I've, um, like I still feel like a beginner and I've probably spent 100, 150 to 200 hours in between Unity and, and Unreal Engine. Like they are beasts, but they're also really fun. Like I, I'm at a point now where it's no longer like an anger thing. It's more like it's fun, but everything just takes a long time. Uh, you know, you might not think that an afternoon could consist of shading uh, the side of a house, uh, but it can. And, uh, you know, that's what you did all afternoon. You shaded the size of, you, you literally adjusted the lighting on the side of your house and you adjusted the textures on the, just one side of your, uh, your house in your 3D space. Why are you thinking that's to make it easier in your digital? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Michael, we're, we're just on the same wavelength. Yeah. Um, but things that can help you and things that you really kind of need to lean on because otherwise this could be even longer is you can get like prefabricated assets. So that can be in like grasses, rocks, trees, some basic structural things that you, you know, you don't need to make another rock. There's enough of those that are free and available. And there's also assets that are, um, you know, you kind of have to think about it. You know, it's like, if you really, um, if you really want a certain type of house and it's there for 20 bucks, do you spend, you know, 40 hours making it yourself or do you spend 20 bucks, right? And there's various decisions, you know, like I, I ended up doing the former sometimes just to learn how to build it, but then sometimes for efficiency purposes, purchase something just so that, you know, for efficiency, because it was 10 minutes later and it's in my If you purchase them, are the licensing like pretty much like, I guess it's different. Depends. There's different licenses, but basically for most purposes, for like artful purposes or whatever, it's, it's fine. Yeah. If it's something like you're uploading it to PlayStation, like of course, like the yeah. PS network yeah, or something, I'm sure there may be, you know, licensing restrictions in that yeah. way. I haven't faced that for obvious reasons, but because I don't I am not like a game designer per se. Um and then there's like plugins as well like plugins are are just parts of a program that enhance or augment uh you know what is capable so some examples are like in after effects itself after effects doesn't play nice or doesn't really do anything with 3d objects but if you buy this plugin called element 3d it now becomes a 3d um it has full 3d support so you can have like a model of like a knife or something and you can put it into your video project and you know move it around and make it a take two days to render it <laughs> and it might take two days to render <laughs> yeah and for example um like to have that sort of location-based uh aspect to ar in unity you can get what's called ar plus gps um and that allows you to add like a uh, what's called a component or a like a sort of addition to um, your project that, that is a localized 
optimize for a certain latitude and longitude, right? So then you can be like, it will only show up exactly right here um, and nowhere else type of thing. Um, and things like, like one thing that I purchased for Unreal Engine is like terrain assets just means like your ground. So like, if you just wanna make ground, um, like you can, like I bought a couple of like really nice ones that had lots of, like they kind of look randomized. So it, it looks like you could make like all of Fogo Island with the same kind of light with like um, lichen everywhere, but like anywhere you walk, it looks different. Like it's not like you can find the pattern, which was really neat. And that was maybe 20 bucks and it was a great investment because I haven't really used that yet, but like when I do, it's going to look awesome. So that's kind of how it works. And, and this is kind of my little VR workflow thing. You all get access to these uh, presentation files, by the way. So uh, uh, just in case I'm going too fast or whatever. Um, and After Effects, for anyone unfamiliar with that, is a video program. It's kind of like what um, title, sequencer, title sequences are usually built from. So if you've watched like a TV show and you see all the type coming in, blasts and out and all this stuff, it's usually built in After Effects. So Sometimes pretty much for video. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> way to put it. It's sort of, it's the Photoshop for video. It's kind of what a lot of motion designers use. And uh, yeah, I, I have an affinity for it because I, I used it for a long time before I ever got into any of these uh, new technologies. Mm -hmm. um, some sample stuff that I've built in VR, um, haven't made any, uh, haven't made like the coolest stuff ever, but here's like a, a few um, like rustic houses and stuff. Didn't end up finishing the, the back there. This is like a, you know, kind of little chair section in Unreal Engine as an example. Some stuff that you can you can do there, just showing a little bit of what these programs look like inside, so that you can have a sense of what's possible. For no apparent reason, I'm just adding a fern. Is this um, subscription based? This program. So the way um, the way like Unity works is you can use it for free. You can download it for free, uh, but you can't pretty much like upload it to you can't like uh, upload it as a as a game you know to any of the main game platforms and stuff um it's also like you in order to to launch like a mobile app onto your phone you need to have like a developer account with apple yeah but for you example. but to learn it's free to learn is free and all that so you're furnishing your house <laughs> sorry <laughs> you're Bad furnishing time. Oh yeah, I'm furnishing my house there, <laughs> and you can see I'm just doing some lighting adjustments. This is uh this is just like a little quick world thing I did, um, you know, just just some terrain stuff, Mandalorian and I. Vibes. What's there? Mandalorian vibes. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> and um, this is kind of my masterpiece, probably the coolest thing I made, and it took me forever, and uh, it's kind of like inspired by like Iceland or somebody. Just to show you, like, this is kind of what you do. You're kind of, if you're kind of like, how the hell do you end up making something like that? If you can see, like, you, you can basically do things like terrain painting and you literally like paint, but you paint like physically uh, or, or in terms of like height. So you can, like, right now, if I want to add sort of a, an exterior section to this, I can like paint over it. And eventually that dark green, I can like change the color. And, you know, that's kind of how you build out your world. You like start with one, you kind of determine its structure and, and paint um, those elements. And then over time, you know, you change colors and you manipulate it in, in those sorts of ways. And you, it, again, you can kind of see like, like in my mind, it's not like it's hard, but it just takes a while, right? It's, it, none of this is like, oh my God, I'm, I'm so stuck, I'm so lost. But it's just when you get to 3D, you have to think of like every single side and mm -hmm. and you know all that. So it just takes forever. So um, 
this is probably the coolest thing I made, which was, I mean, again, 50, 60, even 65% of this is prefabrication stuff, meaning um, it's like stuff that I either bought or whatever, but I, I sort of assembled together. It's like a Viking village, not unlike um, Lance Meadows mm -hmm. in the north. So this was done in, uh, in Unity. And this took forever. This was literally like, you know, I could have had like a baby and, and uh, like I could have had a whole master's degree or a PhD by the time I finished this. So is it a waste of time? I have no idea. What is a waste of time? I don't know. But yeah, I, I am like a lot of this was, you know, doing tutorials after tutorial, like I practice my lighting in this way. Mm -hmm. One of the big things as well as, you know, as you can kind of see very, very um, effectively here is the lighting makes such a difference. Mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. And this is sort of like the, the sort of camera video you can sort of direct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it took forever. It was brutal, <laughs> to be honest. So um, this is this is not going to take much longer. So uh, hopefully to wrap up within five or ten minutes. But what you hopefully see across both of these that is very important is modeling. Like modeling is, I mean, if you whatever you put in this stuff is what matters the most, right? So if um, if you don't have any models or you you know, none of your models are unique because like you just download them for free, then there's a limitation there. And that might be fine, but like modeling is definitely a, a skill set to, to learn whether you're going to decide to use an AR or VR project. And so um, very fortunately, we're in a new world where um, modeling isn't as difficult uh, as it used to be. Um, Basically, there's ways to scan objects uh, using your phone. For anyone who has, I think, an Android, like so a Samsung Galaxy S20 and beyond, and an iPhone 12 Pro and beyond, um, there's what's called a LiDAR, which is a, it's, a, it's this right here. And what it does is it creates a, a depth map of what you're scanning and can create these very enriched um, uh, uh, models in very short time. Um, so you can take like, scan like a bottle, it's just like a hand sanitizer bottle and it will make, so you walk around and you know, the camera's you know, taking all these images of it and basically assembling this three-dimensional model of whatever it is. I just happen to have that at the time, this um, little hand sanitizer thing. And it, um, it even makes like the types of files that you need in order to show off these models. One of the, the ones that is becoming increasingly in use is USDZ. So the reason for that is in Chrome and in Safari, uh, basically it interprets these files and like kind of sets it up for AR automatically for you. So you don't even have to do anything. Um, and uh, anyway, there's a whole bunch of examples um, on like Apple websites and stuff. But so here's some 3D models that like I've built out over, over time. And, you know, none of these are, you know, super, super duper great, but, you know, you can, you can see what um, what's possible there. I uh, I built these actually in what's called Substance Three D, um, which is a an Adobe modeling suite of programs, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, you know I just kind of made like sort of an Art Deco theme, I guess, with this one. And, was there uh, one called Dimension or did I? Yeah. There, there was, was one called Dimension and then they got rid of that one and then they made five programs that do certain specific things as Adobe usually does. Yeah. So, you know, modeling is a big thing. But what I want to show you here is that, for example, um, like this is, this is a cat, my friend's cat. 
and I just, just while the cat was sleeping, I just in the XR resource is called Scanniverse, and you literally can just scan whatever it is, and it makes a model. And it allows you to export it in all the formats you want. There's like five or six of the top sort of file formats. You would never need anything else. Another example is like an antler. Cool. Right? Um, this is like my friend's vase. So my friend makes, uh, she's like a ceramic artist that so she made like this vase. So I'm just showing that. This is actually my uh, my living room. So this is literally like my living room as a 3D model. And you know, that one's not perfect, but I'll, I'll say this, like I put very little effort into that. That was like a five minute scan. Mm -hmm. If you are really wanting to do like, you know, gallery ready scans and you like spent the time, you like, you know, or like I'm gonna do a half hour scan of this, mm -hmm. it would look maybe five or six times better. But this was just a kind of quick and dirty. And I mean, it's not bad. Like, look at how look at yeah, our couch and yeah. our couch is so lit. I love our couch. Sleep on that. It's the best. <laughs> and uh, just wanted to show this too. So like when you have a model, there's also like a lot of these painting programs. There's one called Substance Painter, which is an Adobe one. And you can see how like a very kind of benign canoe shape um, you can you know, add different textures to it. And then you could actually paint onto it. So you can add some like kind of, um, you know, rusticness, I guess, or whatever you want to it. Um, it's kind of interesting. You like literally 3D paint, um, like, you know, blemishes and such onto it cool. and and then export it. And then, you know, you can make, put it in the arrow as a AR project. Do you ever use SketchUp? I, feel like people are um, I don't, but my students do because one of my colleagues is an architect and she uses it in her course, but I just, I don't know. I learned like seven new programs this oh, year, yeah, so I'm kind of like see. done. I know. No, <laughs> and just one more example where it's like a product really and stuff. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can just see like detail and stuff. And so, man, we're right on time. That concludes kind of everything, but uh, for anyone who wants to, you can literally use the AR to grab this, uh, this um, uh, so it's, it's basically a Google doc of all of the sort of key resources that I've gathered. And um, it also, uh, momentarily, I gotta, I keep forgetting to upload, I'm gonna do it right now. Uh, it has um, a link to like my slides that many of which I just got rid of some of the introductory stuff. You don't need to know who I am and stuff, it's, but all the uh, important stuff is still there, like 95% of the slides that you saw tonight. So with that said, thanks. Uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Again, a lot of information, but hopefully it gets you on your way to integrating some of this stuff into your work. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. I remember when it like first started coming out, I was just like trying every all of these AR apps. Yeah. But then, same here. But it was like like slide AR was one that I had for oh yeah. I and there's another one called like Halo or something. Yeah, I mean there's so many that it's just like, exhausting really. But then it's like what's cool about what's happening now, it's like I was like, oh, the user doesn't have this app and then they have to like download it. So yeah, that was that's the, that's always been the big barrier, right? Because you don't want people to have to download apps. Like no one ends up doing it then. Yeah. Yeah. Like I just did sort of the layer one with like a show poster where it was just like, I just exported my layers and I wanted to just like, like a three dimensional. Right. But then I was like, no one can just like download it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can also, um, when you scan, and then there is like a reference model of your work. Oh, so you can load your files over there. And that's and a link. Like other person can see it's like a website. Huh? Yeah, yeah.